Okay, welcome to customizing JupyterLab using extensions. Um, I'm Alex Bozarth. I'm a software engineer at IBM Center for Open Source and Data and AI Technologies, also known as Code. Uh, just as a starting point, I'm making this talk uh, an open Q&A, so if you guys have questions at any time, just raise the hand and I'll pause the talk. Um, the entire second half of this talk is gonna be one long demo, so those questions are important. I'll also be stepping away from the mic to cough every once in a while, so pardon that. So to start off, a little bit about me. I've been a software developer at IBM for four years now, a little bit over four years now. Um, over those years, I've also become a PPMC for Apache Livy, uh, which is an incubating project with Apache, uh, part, uh, related to Apache Spark. And I've given open source contributions to Apache Spark, Apache Livy, um, the IBM Model Asset Exchange, the IBM Model Data Exchange, and most recently, JupyterLab, which is topic here. I'm currently working on creating AI-centric JupyterLab extensions, uh, trying to help out the data scientists uh, that want to use JupyterLab, giving them more extensions to work with to give them a better environment. Um, I also put my contact inf information up there if anybody wants to follow up after this. Uh, these slides will be available in some way. Uh, yeah, so that's my email, my Twitter handle, my GitHub, and my LinkedIn. So that's me, short summary. And a quick summary about uh, CODE, the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, which is a quick spiel. CODE aims to be to make AI solutions dramatically easier to create, deploy, and manage in the enterprise. We are an open source shop within IBM, pretty much fully dedicated to do an open source development that will both aid IBM and, of course, the open source community that IBM wants to support. Um, we're based in San Francisco, and that's a nice picture of our lobby. It's real plants. So, so yeah, that's uh, Code, and I got this cool image from uh, my uh, teammate uh, about IBM's open source participation throughout the year. IBM uh, is active in the open source community as both a consumer and a contributor, and has been for decades, uh, as you can see from all the things that various parts of IBM has been a part of. Uh, we might be big and old, but we're not not hip. <laughs> we, we are the big old fogies of the industry, but uh, we are keeping in touch. So that's, yeah, that's just a little bit of an introduction. So with this talk, um, I want to kind of give you guys just some quick questions like what is JupyterLab? What are JupyterLab extensions? Why you should use JupyterLab extensions? <laughs> when you should create JupyterLab extensions. And in order to answer those questions, I'm gonna kinda go over starting up JupyterLab, installing some basic extensions, and a demo of how you can very quickly create a very simple extension of your own. And as I said before, open Q&A throughout this talk. So if anybody has a question, interrupt me. Just raise a hand. <clears throat> so quick question to start. How many people here know what JupyterLab is? How many people don't know what JupyterLab is? Okay, so most people generally know what JupyterLab is. How many people have used JupyterLab? Okay, so it's essentially the same group. So this will be pretty easy for most of the room. JupyterLab is the next generation UI for Project Jupyter. Yeah, I have a little picture up there of it. Um, nice, simple. It uh, gives a web-based interface for interacting not with Jupyter, just Jupyter notebooks, but also other types of text files, terminals, and using extensions, many, many other types of files. And the goal is to eventually replace the classic Jupyter notebook UI. You can get all of this off of their front web page. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. It is next generation Jupyter notebooks. Any questions? I like this audience. So Jupyter extensions, what are they? Jupyter Lab, from the beginning, was de designed to be extendable. Extensions of Jupyter Lab allow you to create new file editors for different types of files uh, and output your visualization in different ways uh, so you can show a JSON file both in an editor or in an interactive drop-down environment. It allows you to add buttons and menu items to other people's extensions and, already, and features that already exist in JupyterLab. And one of the coolest things is you can actually create backend APIs that run in JupyterLab that other JupyterLab extensions can then call. 
So if you want to create a new API and another extension that uses it, you can do both. And JupyterLab itself is actually just a giant bundle of extensions. They built it, so everything you see in JupyterLab is just an extension that just comes as the core JupyterLab. People kind of getting along, getting that? Cool. So why should we be using JupyterLab extensions? Well, one, the core extensions are intentionally limit limited in scope. They don't want uh, a data scientist and an engineer to necessarily be getting each other's super specific extensions when they open up JupyterLab. They want it to open up, run very quickly, and have the, just the basics, nothing extra. So then you can customize your own environment by installing extensions you need. Because everybody has different roles. Data scientists can use it. Engineers can use it. The layman can use it. So the idea is everybody has their own scenario, and you want to install extensions to your scenario. Any questions on the kind of the overview of extensions? Awesome. So I'm already into my demo. So my goal with this demo is I'm just going to quickly walk you through how to install an extension in Jupyter Lab that already exists, and then. My step after that will actually be to show you how to create your own extension. So I'm going to just quickly swipe over. Please say it works. Yes. OK, so this is my terminal. The best part about this, let me just type. So I've already installed JupyterLab. That's pretty easy. You just pip install JupyterLab. But I didn't feel like having you guys wait while it's installing. So typing out JupyterLab, I'm going to increase the font size here. I don't usually do this. OK. It's the same as every other app. Is that easier to see? Yeah. Okay, Jupyter Lab. What's really cool about this is it will immediately open up Jupyter Lab in your default browser. So this is Jupyter Lab. As you guys said, most of you guys have seen Jupyter Lab before, correct? So in Jupyter Lab, you can open up a, a notebook file. You can open up a Python file, and you can see it's fully editable in the Python file. Similarly, with the core functionality, you can open up a markdown, and you can actually show a markdown preview. All of this is included in core. No extension required. But extensions are pretty easy to install. Uh, you can install them via command line, but there's actually an experimental feature called the extension manager. You just turn it on. It gives me a giant warning in beta. You just turn it on, and for those that didn't notice, there's a new little side button over here, extension manager. I have no extensions installed. Can everybody see this size-wise? Cool. So to, let's try to install extensions. So table of contents is a great extension. Uh, a lot of people have talked about putting it in core because it's such a common extension. So let's see, T-O-C, table of contents. There it is. It even has a little install button. If you click this, it will open up in a new tab the Git repo it's coming from but we're just going to click install. You see the little blue bar going, it's installing. We wait a sec. And then it's done, and just asks us to rebuild real quick. So in the background, while using JupyterLab, it will rebuild extensions for you dynamically without you having to go close JupyterLab. And then once it's finished rebuilding, it will prompt us to just refresh the page. Of course, it is building. It does take a second or two. But table of contents is a pretty small extension. doesn't take that long to build. And if you want to see, oh, it's already done. Click reload. And on reload, you will see there's a new tab over here called for table of contents. And it will show you the table of contents of whichever notebook or even markdown file. If you click, you see it goes to that tab. That's an easy, basic extension probably want to use. You can all see how easy it is to install a pre-done extension. That makes sense to everybody? Cool. So let's try installing another extension. Where are you, extensions? There you are. Let's try Git. A lot of people like using Git. The JupyterLab team has a JupyterLab Git extension, uh, which they would like to remind people is not production ready. <laughs> as they reminded me this week when I mentioned I was going to use it in my presentation. So let's click install in the Git. Oh, it gives us a weird warning. It says it needs a corresponding server extension called JupyterLab-Git. 
Well, sadly, you can't install server extensions through the UI like you can install the front end extensions. So we're going to click cancel and we're going to install that one via the command line. So I have my little environment stuff saved here. We are going to copy this. So usually you just do a pip install, but because I'm using Conda, Conda doesn't like working with native pip, so I'm using a Conda install from ConduForge. So you can see the normal pip install is very easy. So we're going to come over here, going to kill JupyterLab, just do a nice control C, confirm, and then I'm going to paste in my Conda install. It's pretty quick. I, yes. You can install them the same way via command line. Yes. Yes. Um, it typically, if you are uh, a dev and you're setting up an environment for all your uh, data scientists, you would create a script that would just go through and install a bunch of them. That's what my team does for our data scientists. So, so this is just a normal Condor or pip install, and it's done. And then we just have to rebuild JupyterLab because I don't feel like typing. I'm just going to copy and paste JupyterLab build. If I just started JupyterLab, it would have then prompted me to build. But I'm going to do this. It takes a minute again because all of this is, of course, actually doing these things. This isn't all pre-done. All I did was type out the commands to copy and paste them. So as you can see, all of this is very quick. This would take the same amount of time for you guys. Gotta love building. But again, not super long. Everybody here has had those five to 10 minute long builds, right? Or longer. So, faster. Does that build <clears throat> so if you look at it, it says build minimize, so it's actually just building what's changed and the dependent uh, parts of it. Um, when I am doing dev environment work, I typically do full cleans and complete builds on every change just to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, see, nice and quick compared to a lot of stuff. I'm just gonna do this. So then let's run JupyterLab. And I'm gonna kill this other tab. Okay, it remembered where we were, and now inside the extensions manager, Git's there. We also see that Git has created a thing. It's also noticed that if I looked at my file browser, I'm not in a Git repo. So it is telling me, you're not in a Git repo. And it says, go find a repo. So if I'd switch to a folder with a repo, it would find it. But I don't have that. So we're gonna do this. I can Git clone right from in here, and I, I'm gonna get ahead for our next demo and get clone the repo we're gonna use in the next part of the demo, which is the extension cookie cutter. Just copy that URL in there and clone. No, oh, it didn't like it. There was probably a space. Let's see, what did it not like? It really did not like that. Yeah, this worked last night. Yeah, it's just the git clone and the URL. It's not liking it today. Let's see if I can get it from the next. No, it's just the URL. Oh, it wants a dot git. Or not. Wow, it didn't like that. So apparently, it's not liking me today, but typically you can do that. We are just gonna go do that in the terminal then, because we can. So, and you'll notice when I come back, it's already seen it's there. So when I open this up and I go over to the git, oh, it really didn't like it. Remember when I said it's in not production ready? 
example of not production ready. <laughs> So, as I said, it worked last night and it's not working today. Perfect example of not production ready. So, I'm gonna go back to my slides real quick because I bet you anything, there was a step that I skipped when building. But, worst case is we just move on. Yep, we're just gonna move on unless anybody has any questions about installing. You notice that the extension did get installed though. Um, uh, uh, this is a good point to point out. Uh, I did mention it earlier. There's two types of extensions in JupyterLab. There's lab extensions, which are front end, so like the table of contents and the UI side. Those ones can dynamically be added while running lab. Then there are server extensions, which are typically the back end. They are the API extensions that allow that back end your, fr uh, your front end extensions. Those have to be built and run before starting JupyterLab. And they, and, uh, so, that is installing Freedon extensions. So, moving on to the next demo, which is let's create our own extension. So, the repo I checked out was called Cookie Cutter. It's a extension cookie cutter in TypeScript uh, that the JupyterLab community has already made. It's really easy to use. You check it out. We're just gonna CD into the cookie cutter. It's called extension, there we go. And we're gonna follow the instructions in the readme. So if we go over to here, we can open up the cookie cutter readme. Oh, see, markdown preview can get a little weird. So we're just gonna put that there. So these are the steps, pip install cookie cutter. So let's pip install cookie cutter. Done. And then we use the cookie cutter to generate. It's just cookie cutter and then the cookie cup cutter repo name. This allows you to create your own customized cookie cutters and still use their scripts. And it's gonna give me prompts. It's warning me that I've done this before. And so, yes, I want to delete my previous thing. Uh, author, I'm Alex. Um, we're gonna call this my button. And it's about my button. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's asking for a repo that I'll eventually push this to. I'm just gonna copy and paste it, call it AJ, just in case I decide to push it. And it created a whole extension. So we're gonna come back over to JupyterLab where we can actually edit all this. <coughs> Refresh this and you'll see there's a my button in there now. <coughs> ah, pardon my asthma. And so we're gonna open up the My Button extension. All of this is now generated. We have the package.json with all our build rules. We're gonna close all these extra tabs that we've had open. And let's open up the index file. So this is all nice and generated. And right now, if you run this extension, all it does is when it starts, it logs, My Button has been activated. Pretty straightforward. But we wanted to do more than this. So, I have a couple pre-done lines already. So we're gonna drag, so a couple up here, all the way up here, we have this button.ts file that I created beforehand. It has some button code that I'll explain in a bit. But we're gonna copy this. We're just gonna go back to the my button, all the way into source, and we're just gonna paste it. And now it's in that directory, all through JupyterLab. We're gonna close that real quick. And then in order to import it, I can just import it in TypeScript using my import line. And then in order to use this button, I have two nice lines of code that we put in this activate function here. Of course, copy and paste never gets the indentation correct because why would it? Okay, so what we're doing here is we're creating an instance of my button from that class. Then we're adding the widget, the button widget, to notebook files. So whenever somebody opens a notebook, it knows that my button widget is gonna be run with that notebook. And this is the button file. So what I did is I created an extension uses all of these nice long models, but this is essentially saying that it's gonna be part of a notebook file. And I created a create new function. 
which takes in the notebook. And I create a button. My button's called my button. When you click it, it does a nice JavaScript alert. You did it. And then I can easily add my button to the notebook toolbar. I put it in position nine right at the end, called my button. And then it returns the button itself. So now when a notebook starts up, it runs this, it creates a new widget, and the, in creating the new widget, I've given it back a button to put on its toolbar. As you notice, there's lots of imports up here, so we need to quickly copy and paste all those imports into our package.json. Otherwise, it will just not build. So open up the package.json, you'll see that JSON is opened by default in a JSON viewer, which is pretty cool, but not super useful to us right now. So we can do open with, and we can open in the editor instead. And we come down here to dependencies, and we just paste in all these new dependencies. Make sure all my commas are correct. And then the key is JupyterLab by default doesn't autosave, so you need to save each of these files to make sure they build right. Okay, so we've customized that. Is everybody kind of following how easy that is to kind of create your own thing? In general? Okay. And then we are gonna open up the readme for this newly created application. It has build instructions in the readme that was generated by the cookie cutter. And the build instructions are run JLPM, which is a wrapper around yarn. I think it's yarn or is it? An yeah, it's yarn. And we're just gonna CD first into my button. And then we're just gonna run JLPM. And it's gonna build my button. And hopefully it will succeed on first try, as long as I saved everything and there's no missing commas. So because of the fact that I did import a handful of packages that were not there before, it has to download all those packages from NPM. So it does take a minute on the first build. So on your very first build, you run JLPM and it also uh, downloads all the requirements from NPM. <clears throat> but as you're editing your widget, you don't actually have to do JLPM the whole time. You just have to do JLPM build, which just quickly rebuilds the code without re-downloading your requirements. And what's really cool is we come over here, we go over to our extension manager, nothing's theirs, right? Let's refresh this. See, nothing's there. So we must have missed a step. Yeah, we did. So the next step is Jupyter Lab extension link. So we just, in this directory, we're gonna link this current directory to JupyterLab. So JupyterLab knows that there's an extension in this directory that it should be running. You can also uh, link it and install it in other ways, but the simplest is linking local. So we're just gonna quickly run that. And it's thinking, 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 thinking. So what it's actually doing in the background is it's actually gonna do a, again, a minimized rebuild of JupyterLab to make sure that JupyterLab is gonna run with this extension. <clears throat> and, okay, and again, this is all able to be done while JupyterLab is running because it is a front-end extension. But of course it takes a minute or two because it's still a build. Why well, it's building, any questions? you would have to restart the whole thing. Because backend extensions are instantiated and run at the initial runtime uh, because they are server side. Um, so they're usually written in Python, whereas front end extensions are usually written in TypeScript. But not, but not always. Yes, it's the, uh, it's the extension manager. Okay, so you're able to, in your little search for available extensions, is that both back end and front end? Or just it will, I believe it only searches for front end. Okay. Uh, so if, uh, as you saw with the git, if the front end extension relies on a back end extension, it will warn you that it won't work without it. So just a filter set of what you would get if you would get search or something like that? 
I believe it's, yeah, I believe it's a PIP. I believe it's a PIP, sir. There's something on the, I mean, it, but it's some subset of. It's MPM tax. Um, and so, and you can actually, when you create your own and publish your own on GitHub, you can uh, just add that, or, or you, when you publish it on NPM, you can just add that get ta that tag, and then it will show up in the search. So you'll see over here that my button is now shown up after doing a quick refresh without restarting JupyterLab. You also notice that it doesn't have this pretty nice logo. This logo is for people, uh, for extensions developed by Project Jupyter. Yeah. So it's already there. So now we're going to come over here and we're going to back out and reopen one of these notebooks. And you can see it always opens it in whichever section you're currently in. So you'll notice, oh, it's not liking me. Let's try that again. There, my button. It's right there on the end. And when I click it, you did it. Super easy to install, and you can make that button do whatever you want. And if you create a server extension to go with it, you can have it call an API that then takes input from the user and submits it to a backend that does something and returns something. Or you can make it just say, good job. <laughs> so this is how easy it is to create a front end extension. You can do this all inside of JupyterLab without ever restarting JupyterLab, and you can do all your development in JupyterLab, which is really cool. So that is the end of my demo. I did uh, include a bunch of useful links and a link to download this PowerPoint file. Um, so I don't know how we're going to share that link. Yes? I have a question. So uh, if I share this notebook with someone else, I just send over in my office notebook. So the other person have to install <coughs> all these extensions or they will be there embedded in that notebook? Uh, the ex they would have to install the extensions. The extensions are related to their instance of JupyterLab, not the notebook. So the notebook is just a file, and uh, JupyterLab is closer to, I like to uh, compare it to an IDE, but that's not exactly the best comparison. Uh, so their instance of JupyterLab would need to install those, uh, those extensions. Now, if you're using a cloud-based JupyterLab, so somebody else is running JupyterLab on their servers and you're just, o and you're just uh, call opening it through your web browser, you don't have to run JupyterLab local. And so you're both running off the same instance of the JupyterLab, then they would also have the same uh, extensions. But if you're running it local, then you, they would need to install all those extensions. Uh, So uh, as far as I remember, if you are running a cloud environment and you are both interacting with the same JupyterLab instance in the cloud, you will have the same extensions, both server and front end. And so if you install one, I believe in theory they should have it too. But it also depends on who your provider is. A lot of providers silo it per user, so you don't have that. Yes, uh, there uh, lots of different companies are creating uh, bundles of extensions that uh, say these are all the extensions that you should have. Use this script to install them. Uh, and according to my coworker, they can use Binder. Yes. If 
I remember correctly, uh, the person who spins up, there's a setting, you can disable the extension manager, the UI one that I've been showing you guys, which would then make sure users can't install extensions. Uh, or you can, or the, essentially, uh, typically, though it is cool that you can do this on your own if you spin up your own instance, the DevOps team that is running the instance of your Jupyter Lab in the cloud will typically have a set amount of control that they have and a, an amount they want to give their users, and that is uh, usually up to them, and it can range depending on how much they want. It, it, uh, it's very customizable. Um, I, uh, given I mostly work in the open and front end, I have not touched the DevOps side as much. I have a coworker who sits behind me who does it, but um, that's all secondhand knowledge and for, for me personally. Yes. Yeah, um, so, oh, I didn't actually mention this. So I've been mostly writing my own extensions, which sadly uh, I, we have not published and I cannot share with you, despite having them done for a while. Um, but I included a link to this Pi Data Berlin talk from this last summer. There was a great talk where they just literally spent a whole talk going through 20 different extensions that are great and common to use. And I have a link at the end. It's called uh, A Tour of Jupyter Lab Extensions. Uh, they did a great job, and I didn't think it was worth redoing what they did. Yes? How, how do you usually roll out some of the extensions that they're using internally in the team? Um, <clears throat> so when you create your own extension, you can publish it to uh, any NPM uh, repo you want. So if you have your own internal NPM artifactory, you can just publish it to that, and anybody within that has access to that can do it. Or if you want to, uh, you can actually just run it locally. You can have all the code locally, and you just install it locally, and it's not published anywhere. So just like how we just did the button right now, that was all locally, it was never published. You can, you can also embed the engine packages in a uh, 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 Leo, and then modify the setup TI to actually, after you install, like, mostly when you have backend, uh, you do that, uh, and then you modify the setup TI so that that answer? Yes. Cool. This is my team lead, so. <laughs> yes. Oh, um, let's see. I don't believe so. So uh, the Jupyter notebooks, sorry, the Jupyter notebooks are uh, a, a different type of extension, like the whole backend and implementation. So to have the same extension available in in Jupyter Lab, you sort of like have to migrate uh, and and re kind of like a the notebook is based on like on jQuery and a couple of other things. Uh, Lab is like all type script with like npm node and stuff. So they are not compatible in the sense that they can just be redeployed, but most of the very, uh, uh, the most used ones, we have already seen people like all migrating uh, lab. Uh, although I think we announced that uh, the 1.0 uh, at SciPy early this year, uh, it has been under development for two, three years. So people have been migrating the extensions during that period. Yeah. So, and it is pretty straightforward to migrate your own extensions. This button demo I had, my first time doing a button demo, it was. Uh, it was a notebook button. So we had a button, we just moved it over. So, any other questions? Or we could call it early and everybody can get coffee. Okay, um, if anybody wanted to take a picture of that link, just in case it's hard to find it, I'm gonna leave this, yeah, that's my last slide. So I'll leave this up for a bit so people can take a picture. Um, it's ibm.box.com slash v slash aj bozart at uh, dash pi data 19. Nice, easy ish to remember URL. Uh, yeah. So if that's it, uh, thank you for joining. Um, I hope I helped somebody. <laughs> thank you so much.